Now what I want to do is, to start us off, I need help on a project here. We're going to have a taste test. I need a couple of volunteers. If you want to volunteer, please raise your hand for the taste test. Uh, I'll take John T. and Claire. Come on up over here, please. You can stand behind our table here. What I have here are crisps. In America, we call these potato chips. All right, so I have two bags of crisps. All right, we have bag A. And bag B. Is anyone confused yet? No. You guys understand. Yes. All right. So we have bag A of crisps, bag B of crisps. What we're going to do is we're going to have John T. and Claire each taste crisps from both bags. And we have water as well so they can soak it down in between so they can make a clear distinction. Their job, your job here, all right, what you're going to do is you're going to have crisp from bag A, then you're going to take a swig of water, wash it down, then you're going to take crisp from bag B, take some water, then think about it, and you're going to tell our family and friends here which of these bags of crisps has more flavor. Oh. All right, so we're looking for the crisps that have more flavor. Are we ready? Yep. All right, you ready? Okay. Here we go. Grab a handful. You need a handful, you know. All right. Try those out. Cheer them on if you'd like. <laughs> Are you guys getting hungry? <laughs> we do have big bags, so come see me after. Are you ready? You feel like it's all washed down? Is your yeah. palate ready for bag B? Certainly. Yes. All right, bag B of the crisps. This is a very important decision. The entire yes. sermon and their spirit hinges on this decision. All right, let's try bag B of the crisps. Salt gives flavor. 
The other thing that perhaps John and Claire are experiencing right now is salt creates thirst. <laughs> right, so when you eat salty food, you become extremely thirsty. Uh, for Amy and me, we take it another step. Uh, when we eat salty food, we desire something sweet to counterbalance it. We like the salty and the sweet together. But when you taste food seasoned with salt, it creates a thirst for more. It, the salt creates this feeling in your mouth that you just need to wash it down. You need something else to go with it. So salt creates thirst. Now the number one function of salt in the ancient world was for the preservation of food. So long, long ago, and this is up to even a hundred years ago, salt was an invaluable preservative. Now you understand most of history, uh, especially uh, our teenagers, most of history we did not have ice makers. Your parents didn't have refrigerators. No, did that? I'm just kidding with them. Okay. No, we, we had refrigerators. But most of history, we didn't have that. And so the best way of keeping things from spoiling was salt. You would, you would use salt. And if you think about it today, as far as natural resources, wars are fought over oil. Right? Over land that has oil on it. People want to claim that land. Well, long ago, wars were fought over salt. It was that valuable to society. Salt is used to preserve life. You can even rub it on a wound that is beginning to decay and rot and bad things are happening. You rub salt on that wound and it's an antiseptic. So in the first century, salt was vital for preservation. So with all this in mind, let's dive into the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, verse 13. Come Jesus on. says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds, and they may give praise to you. Are you with me? Are you reading with me? No, that's not what it says. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds, and praise your Father in heaven. Today's lesson, we're going to focus primarily on <laughs> verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. So the sermon title this morning is Your Kingdom Mission. Get out of the salt shaker. If you will, get out of the salt cellar. Just get out of that container that holds the salt. That's your kingdom mission. Get out of the salt shaker. We've studied the Beatitudes since mid-November. Your hiking boots now are fitted. Hopefully you are wearing them today. But that begs the question, what happens next? What happens next is you must begin walking with Jesus again and get out of the salt shaker. You see, the Beatitudes, they aren't meant to be lived in isolation from the world. That's not how they work. You don't retreat to live out the Beatitudes. People must see the kingdom in your life. All heaven breaks loose 
when you're living out the Beatitudes, when you live and you breathe these Beatitudes, all heaven breaks loose. And I want to show you what this looks like. It's, it's amazing, but what you're looking at is heaven comes down and manifests itself on earth when we're living out the Beatitudes. It's an amazing thing. The age to come begins to be present in the age now, in your life. The age to come begins to break into the city of Edinburgh. That's what happens when we approach every situation, every day, with the Beatitudes. It's a lifestyle. It's not just a teaching. It's not simply knowledge to think about in the privacy of your own home. These are to be lived out because heaven breaks loose when you do it. We need to get out of the salt shaker. You need to get out of the salt shaker because Jesus will be seen in you for the people around you every single day. Amen. Every time someone sees you, they will experience heaven. They will experience the kingdom. They will experience Jesus. Here in verse 13, when he says you, Jesus is emphatically saying you alone are the salt of the earth. He's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to his followers. You alone are the salt of the earth. And the you here is plural. Back in Texas or North Florida, we'd say y'all. <laughs> y'all are the salt of the earth. The you is plural. It's not one grain of salt. So church, together, you alone are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of Edinburgh. And what I love here is Jesus expresses confidence in you. He believes in you. He believes you can do this because he is with you. He's going to give you the supernatural engines to live out the be this attitude. Jesus believes in you. We can take away all the details. And this is the vision for the Edinburgh Church. To be the salt of this community. Despite our size, despite our shortcomings, Jesus says, you are the hope of Edinburgh. You are the salt of the earth. You are the change that your neighborhood needs to see. You are the experience of Jesus. You are the kingdom that your neighborhood needs to experience. You are the one that can make your neighborhood better. Yeah. All heaven breaks loose when we become the Beatitudes and we get out of the salt shaker. Now, with this in mind, let's go back to the purposes of salt. This is a very powerful metaphor that Jesus is using. And he also uses light in this section as well. Study that on your own. Learn that. But today we're going to look at salt. An incredible metaphor that Jesus uses here. You've got to remember the function of salt. Remember the number one use of salt. This is imperative to understanding who we are and what we do as true citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Salt is a preservative. You are a preservative in Edinburgh. You are a preservative in your neighborhood. You are a preservative in your school, at your work. It's you. So get out of the salt shaker. You see, we are a colony of the kingdom of heaven. That's what we are in this church. We're a colony of the kingdom of heaven. We're an outpost for this period of time of the kingdom of heaven. So we must get out of the salt shaker. 
We must get out of the salt shaker and be rubbed into the world so it can be preserved. That's the vision Jesus has for you. Do you believe this? This is the vision Jesus has for you individually. This is the vision Jesus has for this colony of heaven called the Edinburgh Church. Amen. You are a salty Christian. We must be salty Christians. That's who we are. That's our identity. Salty Christians. We are preserving a world that is rotting away. And to take this metaphor a step further, when you live the Beatitudes, you're not a boring Christian. This is a boring religion. You're bringing zest and life and energy to the people around you. It doesn't mean you're suffering. It doesn't mean you're not dysfunctional or you're going through sinful situations, but it's your mindset and it's how you approach life because you're living to be this attitude. Because you have the hiking boots on, you're bringing zest, life, energy, flavor to the people around you. That's who you are. When you are countercultural like Jesus, your neighborhood begins to taste the spice of Jesus. And it's a good spice. Let's now look at the last two sentences of verse 13. We'll take a look at the end of verse 13. And Jesus, right after giving us this inspiring vision of who we are, he then warns us of tragedy. We don't want this to be us. I don't want this to be you, what Jesus describes here in this second sentence. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Have we lost our saltiness? Are you stuck in the salt shaker of Sunday morning religion and Friday night religion? Are you just stuck in that salt shaker of just coming to those meetings and just getting by? That's it. Staying in the shaker. For you, has Christianity become a weekly meeting for knowledge? rather than a lifestyle that bears witness to the kingdom of heaven. Salt can sit for years in the salt shaker. But it's useless. If salt just stays in the salt shaker year after year, it's useless unless it's poured out on other people. And Jesus warns us that if we're not salting the world, the world is rotting us. So I call you to examine your life. Does this text affirm you? Or does this text convict you? How do you spend your money? Does it look any different than the people of this world? Does how you spend your money affirm you as salt or does it convict you? How you invest your time, does this text affirm you or does it convict you when you look at your diary and your schedule? What about your interactions with your neighbors? your relationships with people in this room. Does this text affirm you as salt or does it convict you that you're being trampled by the world? If we played a hidden video of your marriage, does this text 
affirm you as salt or does it convict you? What about your parenting? What about children with their parents? If we had a hidden video of how your family speaks to one another, will we find meekness? Will we find mercy? Does this text affirm you or convict you? We have Valentine's Day coming up. And I'm praying for my singles. I, I know it's not always easy. It's not always easy for marriage, especially if you forget the card. <laughs> right, we have this date forced on us, you know. You have to do this. But if you're single, and we observed your approach to romance, we observed your approach to dating, we observed your approach to opposite sex relationships. Would we see a purity of heart? Would we see you meek and humble? Or would we see obsessive behavior? Does this text affirm you as the salt of the earth? Or does it convict you? It's very, very important what Jesus is teaching here. Are you any different than all the good and nice people in this city? There's a lot of good and nice, polite people in this city. They've treated us well wherever we go. They're very patient with the American who has said, what would you say again? A lot of good, nice people in this city, but you have to ask yourself this question. It's very, very challenging. Are you different from all the good and nice people in this city? All the good and nice people in your neighborhood. Are you the salt? Mm -hmm. and you say, well, how do I do this? That's what we've been studying since mid-November. Mm -hmm. You have hiking boots on. You approach every situation. How you see the news. How you interact with people, what you think about professional sports even, uh, it, how you approach your finances. If you're in a long queue in the line, you know, queue somewhere and, and, and it's unfair, well, what's coming out of your mouth? It's the little things that make a difference as well. How we view politics and what's going on in the world. Are you different from good and nice people? They may be sugar, but you're called to be salt. Amen. Do people see the salty beatitudes active in your life? Or are you getting trampled by the world? The world's coming down on you. The world is dictating how you feel, how you spend your time. that in Matthew 5, 3, we are morally bankrupt without Jesus. We are beggars who are blind, looking around for bread without Jesus, without grace. So being a kingdom Christian, it's not about just being a good, nice citizen of Edinburgh. Yeah. Yeah. You are not the sugar of Edinburgh. Now, you can throw some sugar around, but your primary responsibility, your kingdom mission is to get out of the salt shaker. So when you are the salt of Edinburgh, this will create in many people a thirst for more. When you are the salt around people that you encounter every day, it will create a thirst for more on their part. It will create a thirst for something countercultural that actually works. People have been looking for solutions to the problems of mankind since the very beginning. If you live the Beatitudes consistently around other people, if you are the salt of the earth, you will create a thirst in some of them that, wow, this is countercultural. And it seems to work for them. No matter the circumstances. No matter the hardship. No matter the suffering. It's working. You're creating a thirst for Jesus. And to know Jesus is to experience Jesus. It's one thing. 
to believe that Jesus exists. It's one thing to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It's one thing to hear lots of teachings about Jesus. But it's an entirely different thing to really know Jesus. To know Him. To know Him is to live Him. To know Him is to experience Him. To know Him is to experience Him and then other people see it. It benefits them in some way and they begin to thirst for it. Because you are the salt. And we experience Jesus when we get out of the salt shaker. People around us will thirst to know Jesus when they see us truly experience Jesus. No one wants a new habit of Sunday and Friday. That's not Jesus to them. They want to experience the life that works. So if you're stuck in a salt shaker, you must find a way out to know Jesus again. Or know Jesus for the first time. And there are no shortcuts to knowing Jesus. It's the same with any relationship. I just can't snap my fingers and I'm best friends with someone and I know them intimately. There are no shortcuts to knowing Jesus. You're the one that needs to get up early in the morning and read your Bible. You're the one that needs to get on your knees and spend time with God every morning. That's how you tap into the supernatural. I can't do it for you. That's on you to know Jesus and it's supernatural. And you can make it happen. But it's your responsibility. To live the Beatitudes, for you to become the salt you're called to be in this world, that takes supernatural intervention. You cannot just gut that out. you got to pray for miracles. If there are things you need to repent of to become the salt, to be the salt that gets out of the salt shaker, get on your knees. I don't control you. Nor do I desire to control anyone. I hope I inspire, I hope I instruct, equip, help. Other people in this church don't control you. The question is, does the Holy Spirit control you? Does the Holy Spirit control you? So when you live by the Spirit... When you are the salt of the earth, it looks and sounds like this. Philippians 3, verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ, and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share in His sufferings. Share in His sufferings too, becoming like Him in His death. Why? that by any means possible, I may attain, like Jesus, a resurrection from the dead. Get out of the salt shaker and experience Jesus. Because our best days as Christians are right in front of us. Mm -hmm.
At this time, I'll ask Junior to please stand. He's going to pray to prepare our hearts to help us remember Jesus with the bread and the fruit of the vine. Now let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you that we can all come together this morning to serve you, to serve one another.